ready for the word today? Yeah. Well, let's jump right on in. We're in this unfinished, unfinished life series. And uh, we got a few more weeks to go with us. And I'd like you to turn with me to Job, Job chapter 7. And I'm reading out of the message paraphrase. And he puts it so beautifully, so succinctly. Uh, he said, this human life is a struggle, isn't it? It's a life sentence to hard labor like field hands longing for quitting time and working stiffs with nothing to hope for but payday. I'm given a life that meanders and goes nowhere, months of aimlessness, nights of misery. How many of you know that uh, Job is not in a great place, amen? He's not in a kumbaya moment right here. And uh, he says, I go to bed and I think, how long till I can get up? Anybody getting older? <laughs> how many of you know when you get older, you don't sleep much? You go to bed thinking, man, is it time to get up again? And I toss and turn as the night drags on and I'm fed up. Anybody fed up in the house? Don't tell me. Uh, I'm covered with maggots and scabs. My skin gets scaly and hard, then oozes with pus. My days come and go swifter than the click of knitting needles. Go click, 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 click. One, two, three. Click, 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 click. And then the yarn runs out and what? Unfinished life. And we've been talking about this for the last uh, six or seven weeks or so. And uh, we're talking about the stewardship of our lives. Uh, that it is demonstrated in our obedience to what the Lord requires. Uh, we want to live our lives His will, not mine. My willingness to accept responsibility and to develop that which He has given me. The greater the measure of gifting, the greater the return is required. How many of you understand this, that faithfulness and fruitfulness is not just nice ideas in kingdom economics, but it is actually expectations. God actually expects you to use what He has given you. Uh, it's an expectation. Uh, it, it's actually more than an expectation. It is a command. God commands you. Say, God commands me. Uh, no, try that again. Some of you don't know if you say command, command. Just, just say whatever you say. Say, God commands me. So the father expects what? He expects a return on his investment. Much is given. Much is what? Required. But I want you to listen to what I'm about to say. Also, anything given means something is required in return. Just because you feel that you have not been given much, uh, it doesn't mean if you've been given some, then guess what? God expects a return on the sum, even if it's not much in your estimation. There's always a return that God requires. And, and fear and perceived harshness from us towards the Father, it's not an excuse for no production. So today what I want to do is I want to lay some, some groundwork because all of this, there is a principle that if we miss this principle, nothing else is going to work. It undergirds everything. It undergirds my faith. It undergirds your faith. It undergirds our life. But especially, it undergirds this truth about operating in the gifts that God has given us. If you miss this, you will miss it completely. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, if you miss this, this principle, you miss it completely. Now, now that is a very bold statement to make, isn't it? I'm going to say it again. If you don't get this, if you don't understand this, then everything else gets nullified. And the word nullified means it just makes it to no effect, which means you can have the appearance of something, but you don't have the substance of it. You, you, it can look like the real thing, but uh, it's a Prada, not Prada, if you know what I mean. It, it's not the real purse. It's the one you pick up on the street in L.A., it just got a different spelling. It looks the same, but it's uh, when you take it home, the badge falls off, and you're like, wait a minute, how do they stay? Anybody know what I'm talking about? So it looks on the outside, it looks great. You might have even have paid for a lot of money, but it ain't the real thing. It's not the real deal. And this, what I'm talking about today, is probably one of the most simplest principles, and it is something that we all have heard many, many times before. It's something that we might even think we've got it down, but I believe we don't have it down. Why? Because the reflection of our lives will reflect the understanding of this principle. So let me, let me I'm going to do a, a, a little bit different today. I'm going to throw out some truths. They might be on the overhead. They might not. Dot them down. Uh, write them down real quick. And then we'll work through this. And I'm going to start a, a, a long way to get to a short place. Are you okay with that? Well, I don't have another message. So even if you're not okay with it, this is what you got. All right? Let me just say this to you. Finished and finished life 
is not measured simply in completing a specific task, but more in obeying what is being asked of me. So when we talk about a finished life, it's not just finishing a specific task that is given me, but it is more than that. Yes, there are tasks that God gives me that I have to finish, but more than that, it is obeying what He has asked of me. Finished or unfinished is determined. How is it determined? It's determined by the choices you make, the words you listen to, the truth or lies you believe, and then the actions you take. Difficulty, a a bad background, unjust treatment, unfair or unrighteous actions against you. All these things will either hinder you or help you. Hinder if you become embittered, angry and frustrated. Help you if you submit all of the good, the bad, the ugly and everything in between to the grace and love of the Lord Jesus. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 5 that we must watch our step, we must use our head, we must make the most of every opportunity or chance we get. You see, we have received the ability and grace to do what is asked of us. The way the Lord accomplished this is not simply giving us gifts and say, and then say, okay, now you better obey and do what I say, and if you don't, you will suffer the consequences of your rebellion. Absolutely not. That's not how God operates. I want you to understand something, and I want you to get this clear, because the whole scripture is premised on this, is built on this. If you you don't grasp this, you are going to miss out. Why? Because what you are going to see when it comes to serving God, you're going to see only the rules and the regulations, but you're going to miss out on the most important. And let me say it to you. With God, everything starts in relationship. With God, everything starts in relationship. The health of your spiritual life, the success of your spiritual walk, the value of your spiritual walk is not measured in anything else but in the way you have learned how to relate to the God that you say you serve. You see, we've got to understand this. Why? Because even problems, when it comes to the problems that we have, is solved in the relationship that we have with the Father. How many of you know some problems are just better solved relationally? Three of you? Let me try this side over here. How many of you know some problems are better solved relationally? Thank you. You guys are so uh, enthusiastic about it. It's kind of, it's the old story. If you ever remember that uh, the professor gave the science students a task and he says, okay, here's what I want you to do is I want you to tell me how long it will take to cook a 10 pound turkey. And uh, so the, the one kid took, you know, took the turkey, measured it, measured the depth, did the calculations, did all of the stuff, you know, trying to work out, trying to figure out, you know, the depth of the turkey, the heat, and what specific heat it needs to be cooked at, all the way and until he got to his calculation. Another one, you know, kind of did the same thing. He actually went and bought a 10-pound turkey. He actually put it in, so in order to come to a conclusion, but the kid that had the solution the quickest is the kid who picked up the phone and said, Mom, how long does it take to cook a 10-pound turkey? How many of you know if you want the answer to something, it's probably best to talk to the person who knows something about the thing you're asking for? So if you want to know something about life, then you ought to talk to the author of life who knows everything about life and especially yours. Everything when it comes to this in God, through God, starts in relationships. It starts there. It's through the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Father, now hear me now, does not simply have subjects that obey Him. He has children that love Him. It's very simple. The Father does not simply have subjects to obey Him, but He has children that love Him. The Father has a household. It's called the household of faith that we become part of in Christ. We belong and we become a new nation. We are no longer foreigners or strangers, but actual citizens. But this citizenship is not merely an adherence to a nation, but it is actually an adoption into a family. 
Now, uh, I wanted to speak to you today on Ephesians chapter 4, but in order for me to get to Ephesians chapter 4, I have to back up. So we're going to back up, okay? And I'm going to start with Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm going to probably let you know we are not going to get to Ephesians chapter 4. Are you with me? We'll save that for uh, uh, another day. But Ephesians chapter 2, I want you to notice this in verse 19. Listen to what it says, because this addresses us. This is you and I. So now you Gentiles are no longer what? Strangers and you are citizens along with all of God's holy people. Listen to these words. You are members of what? Say it again. Say, I am a member of God's family. Do you notice the relationship there? So you're not just a citizen, but you are a family member. Look at verse 20. Together. Somebody say together. Together. Say it like you mean it. We are his what? House built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is who? Christ Jesus himself. Now listen to verse 21. We are carefully what? Joined together where? In him becoming a what? For the Lord. Through him you Gentiles. And if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So that's you and me, all right? You Gentiles are also being made what? Part of this dwelling where God lives by His Spirit. So, so look, at the, look at the picture that Paul is painting for the church in Ephesus. He says, I want you to understand that although you were Gentiles, God has brought you back in. Now you are, you are not just a citizen. That means you don't just have citizenry that is now related to the kingdom of God. He says more than that. He says, you're more than a citizen. You are an actual family member. How many of you know as a family member, you have way more insight than just as a citizen? Because as a citizen, decisions can be made, and and you have to go with it in order to obey the law. But as a family, you get to be part of something. There There is order within the house. And then he says, here's what you have to understand. God carefully knits this house together. God's building something. And, and we, are, we are in process. That means we are not there yet. Why? What does God want it to look like? In the end, it's going to look like a beautiful temple. That's what it's going to look like. He didn't say we are a temple. He says we're going to look like a temple. So he's not putting the emphasis on a building. Are you with me, somebody? He's saying that we are in process. We are not there yet, but we are in process. But when we are done, this is going to be a beautiful thing. But in the meantime, we are learning where God has placed us, and we are working together as a family. We are a house that is filled. We are filled by God's Spirit Himself. We are not merely a house for display. We are a house where God dwells and are filled with God's riches. So, so this is so, so crucial. I'm not getting to the principle yet. I'll get there, all right? But I'm laying a foundation so that you understand this. So we're not just merely a house that looks good. Yeah. Are you with me? Uh, we are supposed to look good, but we are not just that. We are not just for display, although there is a purpose in display. There is function within the house that we are. There are things that has to happen within this house in order for it to become what God ultimately intends for it to become. The beauty of this house is displayed how? When it functions, somebody say functions. Say it again. Say it one more time. Functions in the way God planned for it to function and through that function displays to the unseen and the seen realms this glorious eternal plan of the Father. So so what am I saying? I'm saying that you and I together, collectively together, we are the house of God, we are family members, and God is building a house. He is our Father and He's building a house. Do you understand that? And when we use Father, we don't, we don't use it in a negative connotation. We use it in the best of connotations. Whether you've had a good father, bad father, that's irrelevant. God is our Father. That's what Jesus told us. Jesus told us to pray our Father. So, so it's, not, you know, it's not a patriarchal thing. It is a God thing. And we should not be afraid of saying what Jesus said. Okay, just, that's for free. No worries about that. 
So, so here, yes, the Father's wisdom, so God's wisdom, the, our Father's wisdom is displayed. When is it displayed? When we, somebody say, when we, when we function the way He ordained for us to function. Uh, have you ever heard of the word dysfunctional? Now, why do we call something dysfunctional? It's because when it doesn't function the way that it's supposed to be, right? It's not working the way it's supposed to work. When, when it doesn't work the way it's supposed to work, we say, well, it's dysfunctional. Now, before, before you get caught up, and well, are you calling me dysfunctional? Yes, you are dysfunctional. Everybody in this room at some point in time has been dysfunctional. There is not one dis, not dysfunctional person in this room or online, and don't think you're getting away with it online. You are just as dysfunctional as these buns, maybe even more because you ain't here. No, I'm just teasing you. Am I? But you see that we have to understand so this. So God, through the Holy Spirit, is doing something with us. He's trying to bring us. So what does, God, what does the Father do? He deposits gifts in all of us. And then he says, the way, the way that you will display is that now you bring that gifting. Whether that gifting is singing, serving, loving, giving. Uh, uh, that's not what the gift is. It's not as important as you functioning in it. And how the measure of the gift is, some have greater measure than others. That's not the important part. The important part is that whatever measure God has given us, we are faithful with what He gave us. Why? Because we are showing off this house when we function like that, and we don't just do our own thing. When we understand that we are family, there is power that comes into play like we have never seen before. Because we are literally on display, we are a city on a hill, we are not to be hidden. But we need to make sure that what we display is what the Father ordained and not what we think we want. Are you still with me? So let, let's fast forward just a little bit and let's go to Ephesians chapter 3 because it all flows together. Are you still there, church? So I'm going to take a little bit of time, and, and if my time's up, I'll stop, and we'll continue uh, another time. Is that okay? Yeah. You're going to show up next week again, right? Yeah. See, I'm counting. That's called faith. I'm counting on you coming next week already. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. And this is God's what? Plan. This is God's plan. So what's God's plan? Here it is. Both Gentiles and who what? So who believe the... Good news, share how? In the what? Inherited by God's children. Oh, how good is that? Both are part of the same what? And both enjoy the promise of what? Because they what? Woo, you got to put that on your refrigerator. I mean, or the back of your bathroom door, wherever you spend most time. You got you to gotta, you gotta put, you got to get this. You're going to download this. So what's God's plan? God's plan is that both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share how equally in what? The riches inherited by God's children. I, 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 I'm going to inherit. And, and my, daddy, my, my daddy is not Elon Musk. My daddy is not Bill Gates. My daddy is not a natural daddy. My, my, my daddy is a heavenly father who's got everything I will ever want and ever need. He has got more than enough. He's got every supply. He's got every prayer. He's got everything. He holds the whole world just by the words that come out of his mouth. He speaks and planets come into existence. This is my father. That's the family that I am part of. I am part of a supernatural family that we are honor our supernatural father. And all the promises, so every, all the promises that the Jews got, uh, that because I am now what? Of the seed of Abraham, according to Galatians. All the promises they got is all the promises I got. Why? Because they and me, because we both had to believe. Because the law could not satisfy. So I cannot get righteous by what I do on my own. I need God. Are you still tracking? Yeah. Now watch this. Look at verse 7. Hang with me. By God's grace and what? 
I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading the good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless what? The endless what? The endless what? Available to them where? You have endless treasures. That's available to you in Jesus. And now he goes on because he ain't done yet. I was chosen to explain to everyone this what? Mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept how? From the beginning. Now, okay. All right. So we see God's plan. We see how it orchestrates. We see that we have to believe so that we can engage. We see that we are adopted. And now he's saying, okay, so this is God's plan. And now in the same breath, he's going to say, God's plan, God's purpose. So what's God's purpose? Uh, So God's plan is to reconcile us, bring us back together, and give us these exceeding incredible promises, these exceeding incredible riches. And then he goes in verse 10. Are you ready for this? Look at this. God's what? In All this what? The stuff that he just talked about in chapter 2. The stuff that he just talked about in chapter 3. All of the stuff that he just talked about. He says God's purpose in all of this was to use who? Are you the church? So God's purpose in all of this is to use the church to do what? His what? In its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So we are on display not just from a natural point of view to the world. We are on display to the unseen powers. Which I don't have time to go into. But we we, we know we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We know that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God, right? We know that we are putting on our armor. Why? Because we are battling against principalities and powers and rulers of the wickedness, right? Am I right? So we know there's more, hey, there's more to this than meets the eye. So which means that, now, you gotta, you got to download this. Whatever you do in the natural with what God has given you has an effect in the supernatural. Why? Because your disobedience means there's no display. Your obedience means there is a display. So when the church are doing what God has called us to do and are obeying the Father, we are actually in the spiritual realm shining and displaying what God had purpose and plan from the very beginning. You are better than you think you are. Are you still okay? Put on your seatbelt because you're about to run around like a Pentecostal. I'm telling you right now. And you're not even Pentecostal. Look at this, verse 11. This was his what? Eternal plan which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is God's plan. Jesus comes and he brings us back into what God has for us. And then he says in verse 12, because of Christ and our what? Faith in him, we can now come how? Boldly and confidently into God's presence. Let me make a statement that you get this. Our problem is not that we think too much of ourselves. It is that we think too little of God's plan. Can I say it again? Our problem is not that we think too much of ourselves. It is that we think too little of God's plan. You simply don't know who you are. And you simply don't know who you serve. And you simply don't know what family you are part of when you doubt God's purpose for you. There's more to you than meets the eye. There's more to you than just your natural self. There's more to you than just your day to day. Because in the very next verse, uh, Paul clearly tells them, he says, hey, don't feel bad that I'm suffering. He says, I'm suffering for your sake. He says, but I'm okay. Why? Because he says, no matter what I go through, I'm still part of the plan. 
Because nothing can squeeze me out of what the Father has put me in. Now I want to get to a truth that I believe that we need to download, and I'll come in for a slow landing. Are you ready? The reason we lack power is because we do not understand the love of the Father. I'm going to say it again. The reason we lack power is because we do not understand the love of the Father. Now, I want to read to you. Let's go on now. Let's pick up from verse 14. So the reason I'm, I'm exegesing like this is so that you know that I'm looking at the context of what this passage is saying. I'm not grabbing a verse and claiming it. Are you with me? Do you understand that? I'm showing you that this is progressively how God is working and what Paul is communicating. The theme is still the same. Are you with me, somebody? Not using one event and saying, well, this happened and that happened. Um, that's not what I'm doing. I'm showing you what God is communicating so that we can get this. Look at verse 14. When I think of all of this, this is now Paul saying. He says, man, when I think of all this stuff, all this, all this plan, all this purpose, all this display, all this power, everything that is available to me. Watch this. I fall to my knees and what? Pray, Pray to the He's saying when you have a revelation of what God has deposited in you, the only response that you're going to have is fall to your knees and want to pray. He says, so what's going to happen? He says, you're not going to want to run out and say a bunch of stuff. You're going to fall on your knees and you're going to want to acknowledge who this God is because you're going to realize, wait a minute, this, this is God. This is not a buddy. This is not my best BFF. This is the God of the heavens and earth, and I better acknowledge who He is and that His plan is better than I ever thought, more than I ever thought, greater than I ever thought, that I am more than I ever thought. Why? Because although I was a sinner, but now I'm saved by the grace Although I was an outsider, I'm now an insider. Although I was a Gentile, now I'm a Jew by the Spirit. I'm now part of the covenant of God. And that's who I am. And that's who He's made me. So I'm not a beggar begging for a little bit of something. I am a son asking for my inheritance. I am coming with faith and confidence. Why? Because the same way that Jesus went confidently to the presence of the Father, because He is my older brother, now I can go boldly and confidently. Why? Because I'm addressing my Father who happens to be the creator of the heavens and the earth. He says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray the Father. Listen to these words. The creator of... Everything in heaven and on, I pray. Now listen to his prayer. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited what? He will do what? You with what? Through his? He says, man, you want to get the juice to keep you going? You don't have to juice up. This is not a steroid. This is not something that lifts you up and then pulls you down later on. He says, this is a dynam dynamo. It's dynamic and it's working. It's like it just keeps on going and going and going. It's better than the Energizer Bunny because eventually he's going to run out of battery. But you ain't running out. Why? Because you are connected to an unlimited source of power that enables you to walk through every valley and able to walk through every mountain and able to go through every high, every low because you're in him. It's unlimited. You can't, you can't exhaust it. You can't pray too much. You can't ask for too big. Yeah. Amen, Pastor. Now I like that. Are, are you still there? Watch this. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Now listen to these words. Your roots will grow down into what? God's love and keep you. So your roots must grow down into what? Into what? Come on, yell at me. Into what? God's love. And when your roots, oh, we get into the key. When your roots are in what? Then you are strong. Now watch this. He doesn't stop. And may you have the power to understand as all God's people should. What must we understand, Paul? How wide, how long, how high, and how deep his commands are. Huh? No, his what? His love is. 
May you experience his power. Is that what it says? No, it doesn't want to say. May you experience his power. No, may you experience what? The love of who? Ooh, though it is too great to understand fully. So when you understand the love, when you are rooted in the love, when you get the love thing, and you experience the love thing, though it's too great actually to understand, then, then, and only then will you be made how? Complete with all the fullness of what? Life and power that comes from God. Here's the key. Are you ready? Are you ready for the key? Yes, the principle. All gifts operate by love. All of them. And a lack of use can always be traced back to a lack of love, not a lack of opportunity. Why am I not using the gift that God has given me? It's not because I do not have the opportunity. It's because I lack the love that's necessary. Because until you are baptized in that love, until you understand the depth, the height, until you know, until you know how much you are loved. You see, sometimes we think, oh, how much we must fear. But God says, no, how much you must love. And until you understand how much you are loved, when you realize that you are loved without reservation, without condition, then it enables you to become all that you were intended to become, not what you thought you were, into an identity that God never gave you, but you actually then can identify with Christ and Him alone. Why? Because you are rooted and grounded in the love of God. But why don't I serve? You don't serve because you don't have time. You serve because you lack love. But why don't I operate in my gifts? You know, we ask this all the time. You know, you know why are not more people healed? Listen, when, here's why we want miracles. We, there's two reasons we want miracles, and if we're honest, and we don't want to be honest, but I'll be honest for you. There's two reasons we want miracles. We want miracles so our life can be easier. We want miracles because we don't want to do the hard work that's necessary sometimes to get a miracle. So we want God just to... Swoop down and do the thing for us so we don't have to labor. And secondly, we want, we want miracles to prove something. Now, some of us say that we want to prove that God is real and that God will do miracles. I need you to understand something. You need to know this about God. God is God whether you think it or not. Because here's the reality. Jesus said, a wicked and perverse generation will ask for a sign. And he says, the only sign I'm giving this weakness, they, what do they do? They said, show us a sign. And Jesus said, all the stuff that I'm doing is not enough for you? It's not enough? How many of you know the fact that you're alive? That's God's grace. Because you could be alive today and be dead by next week. And that's a reality. The fact that you're alive and sitting in this room today, that's the grace of God. And you ought to acknowledge it. And that's the miracle of God. I know that, you know, you breathe and you got lungs and you're healthy and all that. That's all good. But all of it is a gift. So if you're not rooted in love, therefore the gifts don't, the gifts don't operate. You say, Henry, well, you know, give me scripture for a while. How about this? How about, uh, let me ask you a question. 1 Corinthians 12 speaks to us about what? Anybody help me? Any Bible scholars in the house? Anybody help me? What's the, what's the topic of 1 Corinthians 12? Thank you. The gifts, right? So all the different gifts. Who, who said that? Was it Dion? No. What, was it that group? You guys are so spiritual. Now, class, these are the favorites right now. But 1 Corinthians 12 is talking about the gifts. Am I right? I'm not making this up. It's in the book. Read it. I mean, it'll help you. First Corinthians 12 talks about the gift. Then, then, then there's something that happens in between 1 Corinthians 12, probably the most famous chapter in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13. Can anybody help me to let me know what does 1 Corinthians 13 talk about? 
And then you have 1 Corinthians 14 that again talks about how the gifts, especially the verbal gifts, the spoken out gifts like prophecy and tongues, how it's supposed to operate within the local body so that there's not confusion. Is anybody with me? So you've got chapter 12 and chapter 14 that focus on the gifts, but right there in the middle, what do you have? You have a whole chapter on love. It's like Paul had a, an accident. You know, he was thinking and he was writing to the Corinthian church and he was writing about the gifts and suddenly the cat jumped and hit the ink and he's like, oh, what was I writing about? Oh, no, no, I'm writing here about love. And then he's like, no, 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 it wasn't love. It was gifts. No, it's not by accident. It's by design of the Holy Spirit so that you and I both know that the, re- listen to me, the reason we don't see what we are supposed to see is because when we want people healed, it should not never be because we want to show off anything but all because of the compassion and the love and the grace that we have the love for God and the love for them when Jesus saw the crowd the Bible says he was moved with compassion and healed them all that word compassion comes from the Greek word which means it comes from the inside When you hurt for other people like that, then you won't care who prayed for them. I I, I just love it when somebody gets healed. Everybody will say, yeah, yeah, I prayed for them. Yeah, yeah, I remember I laid hands on them. Who cares? The key to God's power was and always will be an understanding and grasp of God's love. Inner strength through the Spirit. Home in our hearts as we trust. Roots grow down in love so we are strong. The roots make us strong when it is planted in the soil of God's love. You can't can't treat people like dirt and expect God to move. You can't hold unforgiveness towards others and expect the Holy Spirit to touch lives. Because they all operate. The foundation of the gifts is love, folks. It's love. I don't want to go here, but I'll go here just because you guys are so brilliant. You probably know this already. But that's why when we see in the Old Testament, when the priest went in the Holy of Holies, there was something on the edges of the priest's garment. You know what they were. It was a bell and a pomegranate, right? A bell and a pomegranate so that it's not just a noise, so that it was melodious. There was a beautiful sound when he would go into the Holy of Holies, when he would go into the presence of the Lord. Uh, The bell is that calling card. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, if I have not love, I'm nothing but a clanging what? Symbol and a sounding brass. It's It's saying we have gifts with no love and all that it is, it's noise. says, but when you love people to the point where you are praying for them and your heart are broken for them and all you want is for God to do something in their lives and you don't care who gets the credit except God gets the glory, he says, then you are ready. He says, when you serve, when you serve and you serve out of love, when you're an usher and you greet and you welcome, you get a big smile on your face and it's all just to make people feel welcome, make, make people feel comfortable and, and you place people and seat them instead of having an attitude because you don't happen to be the front usher, you are now the back usher. I can say that about our ushers because they're very humble. They know. Do you want power? You need love. Only when we are rooted and grounded in love will Christ make his home in our hearts through trust. Why? Because of that love, we become complete or mature, not lacking anything. And only then will we experience the fullness of life and power that comes from our Father. Now, I, 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 I took all these verses, and I just gave it one word, so I want to I just give this to you. I think we might have it on the overhead. We might not have it on the overhead, but I, I, I'm just going to put it kind of in our lingo that we understand it. Are you ready? I, I just put one word out there. So here it is. No love, no root. No root, no power. No power, no fruit. No fruit, no display. No display, no confidence. No confidence, no presence. No presence, no impact, no impact, no glory. When there's no love, 
in our hearts. We cannot be rooted because we're supposed to be rooted in love. And when there's no root, then guess what we don't have? We have no power because life comes from being rooted in love. And when there's no power, then guess what we cannot produce? When we don't have roots, there's no fruit. And if there's no fruit, we are not displaying anything. Are you with me, somebody? And if we can't display anything, then we lose confidence. And if we lose confidence, we cannot go confidently in God's presence. And if we don't go in God's presence, we are not going to make an impact. And if we are not going to make an impact, we are not getting what God has promised us, the glory that He said. Possibilities are endless when we are willing to operate together as His house to display His goodness and His glory by being rooted and grounded in His love. Now, 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 let me put the cherry on the cake. Let's get it out. Let's have a slice. Are you ready? Are you ready? So let me read you one verse. Now this verse is, everybody claims this verse But you need to understand, this verse is placed at the end of all the verses we just covered. Context. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Are you ready? Can we put it up? There it is. Ephesians 3 verse 20. How many of you know this verse? Some of you, this is your favorite verse. Look at this. Now to him who is what? Able to carry out his purpose and do what? Super abundantly how? More than all that we dare ask or infinitely beyond our greatest what? Prayers, hopes, or according to what? That is at work where? To him be what? The glory where? And in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Do you see the picture? When you and I operate and are rooted in the love of God and we begin to do what God has called us to do, we are then to display to the principalities and powers. We are letting them know that God's plan works. And when we do that and we are submitted to the house that God has called us, then guess what happens? Now power comes into our lives. And now because of this, we fall to our knees. We cry out. We recognize who our father is. We recognize who our family is. And we treat them with love and respect and honor. And we pray for one another, believe for one another, stand with one another. And then no matter what it is, whatever need may be presented, we can ask from the God that we know our Father who has limited resources, limited resources in some people's minds, but unlimited resources that we know the Word says. And when we do that, we can ask anything. Because it fits into the purpose and the plan that He has ordained. Your problem is not That things are too small for you. Your problem is that God is too small in your mind. Your God is way too little. And because your God is little, you have no confidence. Instead of walking boldly, knowing that I am now a family member. I'm not just a number. You realize that? And when I look around, I look at my brothers and my sisters, and I'm seeing what impact we can make for the kingdom. I'm looking at the gifts and the talents that God has placed in the house. And I'm saying, oh, my goodness sake, look, look how that girl serves. Oh, my goodness sake, look how that girl loves. Oh, my goodness sake, listen to that guy sing. Oh, my goodness sake, look at at that guy right there, right now, working for the glory of God, sitting behind the camera. He sits so still, I can't even see him. (laughs) But he is so focused on me. Why? Because he's got one purpose, to get the message out to those people who are online who happen not to be here and let them know that God has a plan and a purpose. And that kid right there behind the camera, nobody talks about them, nobody say anything except if it goes down, then suddenly somebody will say online, we have no vision. We can't hear the sound. But nobody says ever, ever anything about the sound guy. Nobody ever says anything that put the verses up there because half of you don't bring your Bible. Yeah. 
Am I, am I meddling? That's me job. That's what I got to do. I got to meddle with you because I got to get you to where God wants you so that we can display the glory. So that when they look at us, the light can shine brighter. So that when they see us, they don't see us, but they see the display of the glory of our God and our King, King Jesus. That we are the church of the firstborn. That we are the family of God. That we are men and women who love God, serve God, honor God, and display the riches of His glory. That we ask and we receive. Why? Because we are rooted in the love and grace and mercy of God. We have a confidence that changes everything because it's all about our relationship of love with the Father. Let's bow our heads. I got to quit. I'm late. I just want you to know that God loves you. If you don't know anything else, then know this, that you are loved. And it doesn't matter how far away you are from him. I want you to know that he still loves you because God's love has no limits. So I'm just going to simply ask you, if you've never yet made a decision to follow Christ, if you've never yet embraced him as the Lord and Savior of your life, if you've been running from God instead of to God, if you've been in two minds about, well, you know, should I serve God or should I not serve God, then today that, that uh, vacillating between two different opinions need to end. Today the Bible says, when you hear His voice, do not harden your heart as they did. So when you hear his voice, and this is God's voice crying out to you in a, in a, in a maybe a dumb vessel, and, in a vessel that looks weird or have a weird accent, it doesn't matter. This is God's way of saying, son, daughter, I love you, and if you would come to me, I will save you, deliver you, set you free, and set you on the right path. You cannot save yourself until you realize how lost you really are. You have to come to that place in your life where you say, I cannot save myself. I cannot deliver myself. I need the grace and mercy of my Father. And let Him rescue you. If that's you today, I want to pray with you, whether you're online, outside, or in this room. If you say, Henny, I, I want to make that decision. I want to make that choice. And maybe some of you, you made that decision somewhere, somehow, but you are not functioning the way that God wants you to function. And you need to ask the Lord to forgive you and have a fresh start. Then I want to pray with you today as well. If that's you, while every head is bowed and every eye closed, and you say, Henny, Please, would you pray with me? Would you just go ahead and pop your hand up right now? Just pop it up high and let me see it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I see that. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, thank you. I see that. God bless you. Thank you, thank you. I see that. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. I see that back there. Thank you, thank you. God bless you. I see that. God bless you. Thank you. I see that. You can put it down. Thank you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. There's no magic in this prayer. It's just a way of submitting our hearts to Him. Would you pray with me? Online, would you pray? Outside, would you pray? In this building, would you pray? Just say this. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you today for your grace and your mercy. I submit my life completely to your purpose. I pray now that you would save me, deliver me, set me free. Teach me that from this day, I will follow you and no other. Jesus Christ, be my Lord, be my Savior, forgive my sin, and give me a fresh start. I am yours, and you are mine. I thank you for your mercy, your grace, and your love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. If you believe that, give the Lord a clap offering that he is worthy of today.